Today we are going to become alchemists. Well not quite, but we are going to make gold, but not through chemical reactions. So what can you expect from today's video? We are in the department of nuclear chemistry in the University of Cologne and are using a neutron source to neutron activate platinum. This changes the nucleus of the platinum atoms partially into radioactive nuclei, which can decay to form gold. And finally I just wanted to tell you something about our chemistry. First of all, some platinum is weighed out. This is platinum garbage. It sounds a bit rude, but it's true to some degree. In the past, platinum crucibles were made by bending and pushing them out of a sheet of platinum. And the remains are in this centrifuge tube. Platinum is suitable for use as a crucible in which something is heated and due to its high chemical integrity and relatively high melting point, a crucible should not melt or react away, which platinum checks all the boxes for. So I've been giving 5.15 grams of platinum and I'm going to throw it into our neutron source. If you want to know more about the neutron source, check out this video. Off to the gamma detector with the irradiated platinum and we get a spectrum like this. Marked in red is the platinum x-ray fluorescence. More about this in another video. And here we have gold 199, platinum 199, platinum 197 and platinum 191 lines, as well as two other lines which are not subjects of today's video. So all the black tiles are isotopes of natural platinum. The bar means that it's primordial, so platinum 190 makes up 0.014% of all naturally occurring platinum atoms. But it's also radioactive, just so long lived that it's still naturally naturally occurring. So we can see that natural platinum, like in this crucible, contains various isotopes. These isotopes make up the majority of approximately 33, 34 and 25% respectively. In the neutron source, all of these isotopes can undergo N-gamma reactions, i.e. absorb neutrons from the neutron source and become the next heavier platinum isotope. It may well be that platinum 192 isotopes contained in the sheet have captured neutrons to become platinum 193 and there is a chance that platinum 193m is formed, which the chances are quite high because of the relatively high cross section of 6 bonds, but the platinum 193m does not emit gamma quanta when it falls down into the ground state, as we can see from this bracket. The isomer transition occurs mainly via conversion electrons, which we can't measure because I was using this gamma detector. Platinum 193 has a too long half-life and it doesn't emit gammas, which is why they are not visible in the gamma spectrum. If platinum 194 captures a neutron, radioactive platinum 195m may be produced. This makes an isomeric transition by emitting gamma photons. Unfortunately, it was not possible to recognize these transitions in the spectrum. Even if, according to the occurrence probability of 11.1%, it should be sufficient. I don't know what happened there. Platinum 195 can capture a neutron and become the stable platinum 196. Well, you can't see that because there is no decay. Existing platinum 196 can also capture neutrons to become radioactive platinum 197. And here you can see the lines beautifully. Like all gamma lines, they occur when platinum 197 undergoes a beta minus decay to become gold 197. The gold is in an excited state and falls to the ground state. And depending on the excited state, it emits the 77 kilo electron volt line or the 191 kilo electron volt line or other gamma energies. The lines are still called platinum 192 lines, even though they are technically produced by gold. This form of gold can only be reached by the decay of platinum 197. Each atomic nucleus has tens of different excited states, a bit like flame coloration. So and then we have gold 197. Stable gold, real gold. Yes, but it's made from platinum and platinum is a bit more expensive than gold. And only a few million atoms. That's nothing. One nanogram is still 3 billion atoms. By the way, we also made platinum 199 from platinum 198, which decays to gold 199, and that turns into mercury 199. So we also made mercury. But as I just mentioned, no, if I left it in a neutron source for thousands of years, no platinum or gold amalgam would form. Nice, now we have talked a bit about neutron activation and transmutation. In short, transmutation describes the transformation of one element into another and this can be done with nuclear processes, but not with chemical processes as the alchemists tried to do back then. So now the video should end, but 
It's a bit short, so I'm just going to tell you something about alchemistry. Anyone who has ever heard of alchemistry may be familiar with the Philosopher's Stone. Is that even a stone? Where can you find it? Does it shine beautifully? First of all, what was the aim of alchemists? Not only to produce gold, but it was considered the highest discipline to make gold from lead, for example and often they tried to produce silver from copper. The Philosopher's Stone was supposed to serve as a substance that made this transformation possible as part of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. That sounds a bit like a catalyst to me. Some meant a tincture that had to be added to the reaction. Others said it was a powder or the powder. The substance was also expected to cure all diseases. Some other people describe the Philosopher's Stone actually as a stone or as a crystal and when it's young it's white and can only produce silver and once it's aged it turns red and can then turn lead into gold. But why am I telling you this story? Well, because we made gold today and I finally know the story behind this picture. There was an attempt to find a Philosopher's Stone but what was discovered was phosphorescence or phosphorus. In 1669, the alchemist Henning Brandt carried out an experiment with the urine of beer drinkers, which contained quite a large amount of phosphates, about 1.5 grams of phosphate salt per liter of urine. This was all left to stand and evaporate and eventually the waxy residue was heated to red hot. I will never recreate that experiment in my entire life. You will have to ask Nalred to do that. And what happened chemically there? The dissolved sodium phosphate contained in the urine was reduced with other organic compounds. In the heat and the absence of oxygen, this produces carbon monoxide and white phosphorus, among other things. The light emission is described by a batch of different reactions. Light is generated in various chemical processes, which all together create the white glow. Some of the mentioned reactions take place in parallel. It's a complicated reaction sequence and if the flask in which you have previously boiled down a few thousand liters of urine suddenly starts to glow, it's quite understandable that you think you have discovered the Philosopher's Stone. But unfortunately he only discovered elemental phosphorus, which is very impressive because at that time the concept of chemical elements as we know it today did not exist and white phosphorus is already quite complex to produce elementally. So I thought there was a nice link between us who threw platinum into a neutron source and a dude who boiled down several hundred liters of urine 400 years ago. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.